This week, our good friend Ron Gula joins us to talk about cybersecurity investments, tips for both enterprises and entrepreneurs. In the enterprise security news, a lot of funding announcements. Coalition, Herasoft, Cowbell Cyber, which is my favorite name for a company that got funding this week. Argonne, Cynet, Docker, uh, Cyware, uh, Acquisitions, Sonatype acquires MuseDev, SumoLogic acquires DF Labs, Acronis acquires Synapsis, different from Synopsis, Lookout grabs CypherCloud, and a cybersecurity SPAC. Casada announces some new features to its bot detection offering. Rapid7 introduces an agent for CloudFront. Aqua supports ARM. Chris Roberts joins Cynet. Uh, in our last interview, we do Ilya Kolachenko, the founder and chief architect at ImmuniWeb, to talk about attack surface management. Stay tuned for all that and more on this edition of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. As your attack surface stretches from the data center to the cloud and the device edge, security teams need visibility across it all to confidently detect and respond to threats. Experience frictionless hybrid security that helps you stop breaches 84% faster with ExtraHop's Reveal X360, the first and only SaaS-delivered network detection and response. Explore the interactive demo at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. JumpCloud offers a cloud directory platform that gives users a single identity for their email, apps, network, and work device. Whether Mac, Windows, or Linux, JumpCloud gives IT admins a single pane of glass to configure and secure those devices. With JumpCloud, remote onboarding and offboarding goes from hours to under five minutes and puts zero trust security within reach for organizations of any size. Looking for a directory that supports heterogeneous OSs or you need just SSO, MDM, LDAP, or MFA? JumpCloud will make your job easier. Try it out for yourself at securityweekly.com forward slash jumpcloud. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly. It's episode number 220, right here on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, 2021. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined remotely by Adrian Sanabria. Adrian, welcome. Hey, uh, looking forward to today. Some great interviews today. Absolutely. No green lights today. It's St. Patrick's Day, but no green. You had green uh, oh, before. Oh, oh. Uh, I will treat that as a request and fix that short. Got to work on that. Mr. Tyler Shields is here with us with some something written on the whiteboard. Yeah. So so today it says, uh, you know, some write their passwords on a sticky note, some in a notebook, but the brave use their whiteboard. <laughs> it's a, I didn't come up with that, uh, Gustavo, from your team did, but I thought it was uh, whiteboard worthy this week. That's right. So whiteboard is your password. Interesting. Taking notes. Uh, don't, tell anybody. <laughs> don't tell anyone. <laughs> Uh, let's see a quick announcement before we get into it. If you want to stay in the loop, all things Security Weekly, visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. Subscribe to your favorite, on your favorite podcast catcher to our YouTube channel. Sign up for our mailing list, join our Discord server, and check out all of the shows on the Security Weekly network. Joining us today, of course, our good friend Ron Gula, president at Gula Tech Ventures, is here with us and so much history in, in cybersecurity. Our paths have crossed many times. Ron, welcome to the show. Hey, Paul and everybody. Glad to be here. Good seeing everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Yes, it is St. Patrick's Day. I'm looking forward to uh, the resulting meal and beer, uh, corned beef, cabbage, and beer. It's good. I eat it once a year. <laughs> So, Ron, um, we want to talk about uh, investing, and I want to I want to talk about it in a couple of different uh, aspects. I guess we'll start first with the entrepreneurial aspect and how difficult it is to say the word entrepreneur uh, for me, at least. Uh, but you've got uh, a, a great, and it's often referenced when we're talking to uh, startups. Is your uh, article? I think you did uh, presentations on it as well on how to uh, put together a pitch deck, right? Yeah, I've got something called the uh, five slide pitch deck, and I will transform that to like five questions you should ask yourself if you want to start a cybersecurity company. And uh, it's pretty straightforward. The first one's the hardest one. What problem do you solve? Mm. You know, then the second one is how do you solve it? Third thing is, you know, do you have some proof? Fourth thing, if you're going to ask for some money, 
you know, what, uh, what are you gonna do with the money? And then finally, what is your vision of success? And you would be surprised how many people can't answer those questions. And, and it really drives to the core of, uh, of their startup. They all, I often find, Ron, when I work with startups too, is that they, they've got like a 20 slide pitch deck. Like they're just going into all detail all across the map, right? And then this is great because it really helps them consolidate it down. Like this is what investors want to hear basically, right? And focus. And, and this it, is kind of st- tough because you don't want to say that a vet, an investor isn't going to read your deck. But the reality is if you get 20 or 30 you know, PDFs or PowerPoints a week, hmm. you can kind of go through them pretty, pretty quickly. It's kind of like, I've seen this episode on TV before, right? Or this plot's been done before. And because really two companies really fall into two categories. They're either 5% better than what's out there. You know, I can detect malware better than CrowdStrike. I can find vulnerabilities better than, 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 than Tenable, right? Or I'm coming to you from the future with some problem that you've never even heard of. So, you know, the investor is going to be looking for one of those two things that they, they kind of know what they're looking for. So this helps them be efficient and it helps you be efficient because last thing you want to do is do a two hour pitch meeting with somebody who has no interest in really investing in you. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting with the 5% better and like amazing futuristic idea, both those are grounded in tech. No, I mean, do, do you dig into the tech in both of those kind of categories? Well, technology is definitely a, an, an issue here. And, you know, the 5% better, you know, Renaud Darrison, our co-founder at uh, Tenable, he, he kind of told me that. And once he said that, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely seeing that. And it can be applied to anything, like how my VPN, it takes, you know, 5% less CPU than, than, than everything else. Or, you know, I have a Docker control system that can manage, you know, a little bit more. It's a little bit cheaper. There's always something better, faster, cheaper. And if it's only 5% better, faster, cheaper why is someone going to switch over to it? You know, maybe you're bringing it to a new market and you're in a greenfield and that's fine. Maybe you really are going into the enterprise and trying to recreate things. I mean, when Palo Alto started, the world wasn't saying, wow, you know, we really need a next generation firewall. Yeah, they, they certainly, I think, created that category. Do you look for category creation too? Or is it, is well, that's it that, hard, right? That's that, uh, if, you're, if you're solving a problem that uh, you know, nobody knows they have, or like I didn't realize you could unify you know, these two things or these, these, uh, these different kind of market, that's a market creator. Now you look at something like um, the breach and attack simulation market, right? You mm-hmm. got Veridin who got acquired by FireEye. You got stuff you know, more advanced like the Scythe tool, which actually simulates you know, full on you know, benign malware. You know, people would say that's just an extension of penetration testing, but it really is a different market, breach and attack uh, simulation. You look at something like SOAR, people would say, well, SOAR is just alerting that was the SIM vendors were supposed to do, you know, and now you've got XDDR, XDR, which is kind of, you know, unifying, you know, all those things together, including the endpoint. So these these market creators are, are a little bit, you know, kind of built on the shoulders of the past, but sometimes they really are new markets solving, solving real problems. It doesn't necessarily have to be a new market, though, right? If you've got an amazing I mean, new, new way, right? I said market, but I probably really meant category. Mm. You know, the, the really thing is, is perception of these categories is is in, it's it's a little bit all over the place. Is there a buyer, you know, at the, these enterprise organizations? Is it a, something tracked by Gartner? Is it um, like, like I really don't think, um, I don't want to like, you know, people are working on a lot of different things, right? I'm not really looking to invest perhaps in better quantum resistant cryptography. I mean, that's just not something I'm, I'm, I'm looking to do. And most venture capitalists aren't really jumping on that. And I'll probably get some hate mail, hate tweets because of that. Mm-hmm. But because of that, I don't really see like there's this big crypto market a- out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, cryptography has been around for a long time, but people aren't, if anything, they're moving to the cloud and buying CASB solutions, you know, Zscaler, Netscope. How can I use crypto to get me to my, my uh, cloud applications? But people aren't trying to like switch out their network cryptography because they're, they're uh, afraid China's going to somehow decrypt all those packets. Well, yeah, it seems okay, like yeah. you can be uh, early and, and, you know, being early to market and late to market come with their own challenges. Yeah. I mean, if you're early to market, uh, you can have the best solution, but if nobody's buying it, um, you know, maybe it'll go, you know, it'll go early. Like we were in a company called Pertigo and Pertigo was basically uh, a RASP, you know, runtime application software for, um, uh, for Amazon's uh, Lambda. And, you know, Pertigo came out, they, they, uh, they, they were educated in the market. They got an early acquisition and they went to Checkpoint. So as an investor, I'm happy, 
But, you know, maybe that sort of curve of usage or of, of, of adoption of people who are trying to build security into, you know, serverless uh, code, that, that, I think that's still a big growing market. So re real quick, Ron, uh, good good to see you. We've spoken a few times in the past, but I don't think we've actually had any FaceTime. So I kind of uh, am glad or we're on Skype here today. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so talk to me a little bit about that early exit, not that one in particular, but you know, coming from the vantage point of a VC, the exit timing is, and the impetus for exit could be very different than the uh, than the founding team. Can you talk to, talk to me a little bit about what makes an exit good or bad in the eyes of an investor? So I'm going to actually flip that question around and talk about what makes an investment or an exit good in the eyes of the founder. You know, if you're starting a company and and you're told like, hey, you want to be a successful cyber entrepreneur, and and that script was you need to have an idea, you need to recruit a team, you need to raise money, you need to raise a couple of rounds, you need to go public someday. Like if that's your vision of a successful entrepreneur, that's you're you're going to be in for disappointment. I mean, the vast majority of companies who start, mm -hmm. you know, basically they get acquired or go out of business, and they don't really even break ten million dollars in revenue. So, having said that, if you're a technologist and you love to create technology, as soon as you've got some product market fit, which means you've actually sold the product and somebody has bought it, this might be the best time ever to sell your company because you're you're sort of focusing on the problem, you're focusing on the customer. Now, if you have to go build a build, build a company to support 100 customers or 1,000 customers, now you have to have a different set of skills to do that. You have to hire customer support. You have to maybe raise some capital to build the infrastructure ahead of those customers who are spending money with you. You might have to invest in marketing to raise awareness about how awesome of a, of a technology you are. You might even have uh, copycats who take your ideas and put them into other projects, other companies. And now you've got to kind of fight, well, why is mine better, better than theirs? In other words, there's this whole other path you have to go down to build a giant company. Now, if you can do all that, you know, the payoff's great. I mean, the journey I had at Tenable Network Security was, was, was a lot of fun. A, a lot of people go through, you know, different types of, uh, of companies and sell those. But that fifth question I asked, what is your vision of success is really what this all comes down to. Now, having said all that, as an investor, if you know what the founder's vision of success is and it's in an alignment with your goals as an investor, well, then you're good to go. But if you invest and you think somebody wants to go big and they sell next week because you know for 2x your investment, you just risked a whole lot of money for a little bit of return. And that's usually where these discrepancies or faults between investors and founders come from. Got it. That that makes a ton of sense. Um, very quickly, in the choice of where to invest, right? Um, so I do a fair amount of investing myself, nowhere near to your size, of course, but I do some cyber investing and there's a certain thing you look for in people that I've never been able to actually put my uh, verbal around, right? Verbally explain. Can you explain what you look for in the founding team? Because I always talk to investors and they're like, you know, especially early investors, what we care about is the founding team, the founding team. What are we looking for in the founding team specifically? Yeah, so when, when you invest in a company, it's a lot like going on a ride at uh, at an amusement park. Like you can't ride all the rides. They're, all of them are not, you know, things that you might find. You might not like a spinning ride. You might not like fast rides. You might, you might not like rides with heights. It's the same thing with startups. You know, you might have a preference. Maybe you want to physically see people. You know, even in the time of, uh, of COVID, maybe you want to invest regionally. Maybe you want to focus on ex-intelligence community folks, folks from all over the world, ex-Israeli Intel, ex-GCHQ, UK Intel, ex-CIA, FBI, NSA, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe, maybe you really want to do things that are threat-based. Maybe it's a category. Maybe you might want to do threat feed, threat consumption, different things like that. So you have these focuses, and, and I've seen people really, really go through that. But then when it comes to the team, what do you want to see in a team? Do you want to see one founder? Do you want to see five founders? Do you want to see a charismatic leader who's got a social uh, you know, media presence and, and, and speaks well at conferences? Do you want to see the PhD who's behind the scenes and isn't really good with customers? So until you've seen a bunch of different kinds of companies, it's kind of hard to kind of say well, as an investor what you might, uh, what you might like. If uh, folks are folks are investing on this, they want to they want to learn how to invest. It's it's very interesting because on on some deals you have to be an accredited investor, which means you have to say you have a couple million dollars worth of uh, of net worth to do certain types of, of of investments. But there's other things out there. You can actually put money into funds. 
There's a lot of great seed funds out there that, you know, $100,000, $200,000, you know, you might be able to invest in that and, and get a look at 100 companies, you know, and not have to do the meetings themselves. You know, there's kind of, if you have a background there, there's, these funds might be able to come in and, and, and do that. Lastly, you know, you want trustworthiness. You want to know their goals. Can they communicate? Um, you want to look for potential issues like, is there a co-founders? Maybe it's a husband and wife team. Maybe it's two brothers. I always like to talk about how awesome it was to work with my wife. That's not for everybody, you know? So you can pull from all that background and ask people, you know, any questions you want. Cause it's, uh, you're going on rides with them all day after that. Yeah. The, uh, it's super interesting to me because again, I'm very, very interested in, in growing my own investment base, but I'll try not to dominate the conversation, Paul, mm -hmm. let it go back to you after this, after this final question. But, um, you know, this one might be a little bit of a trickier question, but valuations feel like they're off the charts. I can't tell you how many unicorn announcements we've had in the last month alone. Everything from SNCC at four and a half billion, um, Aqua just passed a billion. Um, I don't know. There, there's literally been a half a dozen in the last few weeks. What's your thoughts Exonius. on valuations of cybersecurity, Axonius? What's your thoughts on um, valuations of cybersecurity companies? Are we in a weird cybersecurity bubble? Will this all kind of, uh, you know, I guess finish itself out in the public market with some SPAC exits. Uh, what are your thoughts on valuations? So a couple couple comments. Uh, Paul did such a great job reading, you know, the news of all these acquisitions and, and announcements and mergers and investments. And if you do that every episode, you're going to have to de then dedicate five minutes or ten minutes to that, you know, every, every week. There's a lot to track. Now, having said that, mm -hmm. there is, if you noticed, we're not doing that well in in cybersecurity. You know, we, we had solar winds, we had a massive Microsoft reach. We have not solved the fundamentals of security engineering, identity management, and the general public really is pretty apathetic. Uh, one of the big things we're trying to do at Gula Tech Adventures is raise awareness about cybersecurity outside of cyber. So yes, there's a bubble. We are well in that bubble. The bubble is growing. I don't think it's going to pop and you're going to see a massive devaluation. Now, markets come and go. They, they, they really do. And right now, I really think the Biden administration is going to be spending a lot of money with, uh, with DHS, with the Department of Defense. They're going to probably pass regulation, which is something the Trump administration did not want to do. That's going to cause commercial vendors to need to spend more money. Uh, my brother is an amazing uh, mechanical engineer at a, at a, uh, a I'll call it a, a defense industrial based place. Literally like two years ago, he was saying, hey, we got a vulnerability scan. Now he's doing poems. And, and, he's, and mm -hmm. you know, so this is going to affect the entire country and it's going to cause valuations to, to go up. We just seen our first SPAC announcements. Actually, I think technically the first security SPAC was App, AppGate, mm -hmm. uh, which got spun out mm -hmm. of where uh, Dave Vitell uh, went to. I forget, the, I forget the name, but then IronNet, uh, they just announced that they're being acquired by a SPAC. And it's, it's a weird thing. Like if somebody buys half of your company or more than half, that's technically an acquisition. But the way these SPACs work, it's like this this join merging thing where one day you're not public and, and the next day you are public and you've got a lot more capital on your uh, so iron net so congratulations to them you know you're going to see a lot more of that so we are in a bubble the bubble is going to continue to get big because i don't see anything changing and if you look at the kind of laws that uh the congress is trying to pass none of them have to do with security engineering or solving the problem it's all more hunting it's all more hygiene which don't get me wrong that's great for CrowdStrike. That's great for Tenable. It's not a bad strategy, but it's not solving the fundamental problems of cybersecurity. So we are going to be in this market for a very, very long time. Ron, how do you see the uh, kind of consolidation of security companies versus new companies coming onto the market and getting getting funded, getting created, and, and entering the market? Do you see that kind of ebb and flow happening for some time, or are we going to reach a point where there's a lot more consolidation than there are new companies coming on the scene? Yeah, so I'm I'm looking at more uh, where where there's friction. So if you look at something like Apple, and you know Apple's got Big Sur, and if you have any customers who are on CrowdStrike, you got to ask them, hey, when is that CrowdStrike agent going to be ready for, for for Big Sur? You know, a lot of products out there, you know, in the name of security, you know, Apple in this case, you know, are they're hard to run on these things. So you have, um, you know, vendors that are sort of at odds with dedicated security companies. So the question is, is what's the long term? You know, if, if you look at something like JMF, for example, mm -hmm. you know, are they going to be always outside of Apple? You know, helping Apple get patched, helping them do authentication, and and they they just bought a great Sysmon like company called uh, CommandSec or CMD Security. I apologize to the guys there, 
uh, for not having the name right, but but it's it's um, it, it's really interesting. So the question is, is what would an IBM of cybersecurity look like? Because if you look at mm-hmm. like computer associates, there's some amazing cybersecurity technology there. But you know, people would kind of say that's for companies who don't you know aren't at the cutting edge, kind of go to get get acquired. Well, look at Palo Alto. Palo Alto was just they just acquired what their fourth or fifth you know cloud security company. They started out with Evident IO, and they most recently bought uh, Bridge Crew. And and you can see they're very very open to acquiring these different kinds of technology. Is that what the hundred billion dollar cybersecurity company of the world of the future looks like? It's hard to say. If you hear Keith Alexander talk about you know collective defense and what he wants to do with IronNet, you know they're they're talking about really kind of sharing, almost being like a private NSA for for corporations in in, in cybersecurity. I mean, there's definitely an opportunity for that kind of stuff. As a consumer on the enterprise side. Do you do you go with the larger vendors that are consolidating like Palo Alto or do you go with point solutions and and how do you navigate those waters? I I often have a tough time advising enterprises like like what do you do because there's some great startups with some great tech but you can also get a bunch of it in one place. Yeah, I mean everybody wants, you know, uh best of breed and single pane and of glass culture <laughs> until they want to watch YouTube on their classified, you know, mobile device, you know. It's it's <laughs> The needs of the users are are you know they really outweigh security in many in many cases. Um, you know we're seeing things like well Firefox. You know Firefox is coming default doing uh, you know DNS queries over HTTP. Well, is that more secure or less secure than DNS? And am I okay giving all that data to like Firefox? Now change Firefox to Chrome, mm. and people are really like, well, I don't know if I trust Google for 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 these kinds of of, of things yet. Google looks a little bit more secure than Office 365 right now, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's it's best to breed, and what are we using to protect our our data? It is so difficult. And and one of the things I like to do is I like to go into high schools, community college, and talk about the basics of CIA confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and then just start talking about well, how do you answer those questions on a phone? How do you answer those questions on on email? You know, how do you answer those kind of questions on a, a Chromebook, you know, running a Facebook app? You know, who has access to your data? Who do you trust? Those fundamentals are not there. So in, and until the public really figures that out, it's the Wild West. It, it, we're going to see all sorts of companies coming at this from many, many different angles. You think Microsoft has a strong play in security to displace some of the other players in the security market? Well, I, I secretly believe Microsoft named the Solar Winds hack Solar Winds to to absolve any you know wrongdoing of Microsoft. And it, you know, because if you think about it, every other uh, major breach we've had had some other name, right? It, like Meltdown wasn't the Intel bug; it was the Meltdown bug. Right. Uh, you know, WannaCry wasn't a Microsoft issue; it was it was uh, it was WannaCry. Uh, you know, yeah. a, a Windows bug, right? Mm-hmm. So Microsoft does a lot to help people, but they are also the biggest target. So the question is, what you know, what liability they have as a, as an entity, you know, out there. I mean, they got thousands and thousands of people working on nothing but security. I mean, they're working harder than anybody else. Yet when something you know zero day happens, like in like an exchange, oof, that's 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 tough. Um, so are we always going to have third parties who who do things? I think so. And I think if we have a few more solar winds and a few more Office three sixty five attacks. You're going to see some people go. You know what? Maybe I'm just going to run Kube on VMware in my data center, and I'm going to get. I'll build my own cloud of all my resilience, all my elasticity, but I'm going to do it myself. You know, because I mean, Office 365 was supposed to be. Hey, trust us. We're going to filter all your mail for you, and you know everything's secure by default. And it really isn't going that way. So it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. But that's opportunity. Anybody who's starting a company who can solve any piece of that puzzle is going to do fine. It's interesting what you're saying is the the trust in Microsoft is degrading as we have more of these breaches. I uh, I I um that's interesting. I mean, I uh we all trust these these vendors. I mean, when you download those updates, you have that's to. trust. You're mm-hmm. trusting them to put the right code on your on your computer. Now, can that be subverted? Of course. Do they make mistakes? Of course. But you know, it's at, at what point is the trust in the computer and the operating system? the same amount of trust that we have in our cars. Like if you got in your car and it exploded and, 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 you know, somebody got, you know, loss of life or, 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 or business risk, we have clear legal laws against that sort of stuff in cyber. It's still early, early innings, right? Mm. Nobody really seemed to be that angry that there's 30,000 exchange servers running on-prem that were completely compromised in probably the biggest cyber espionage, 
you know, effort ever go and ever. There's the public reaction is just hard to, to, to do that. On the other hand, you know, our response is kind of pathetic. Hey, we're going to require disclosures. We're going to require more hygiene. It's not going to change anything. So I, I think it's really up to vendors and, and people like your show and, and, you know, getting the word out that, you know, you have to fight this fight in many ways on, on your own. I want to ask a, a specific question because we ponder this. Adrian and I are, are looking into attack surface management, uh, both open source and commercial solutions. And we were just wondering, like, why hasn't a big vulnerability management company gone out and acquired an attack surface mapping? It seems like there's a really good marriage there. You're talking about like a like a tenable buy in a Shodan, that that kind of thing. Or uh, Adrian, what are some of the ones on our our list? Uh, uh, Randori, Psychognito. Uh, Palo Alto acquired uh, expanse in the space for yep. for eight hundred mm -hmm. million. Yeah, so there's there's two things there. So I mean, Tenable, of course, we can talk all day about. Anytime you want to talk about that hmm. more, it's good good stuff. Go buy Tenable right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but if you look at Qualys, Tenable, uh, even like HD's Rumble now, Rapid mm -hmm. Seven, you know, the, the the main default thing is pointing that infrastructure at something you know like a class B network, a bunch of networks, you know, your Amazon VPC, something you know, and then auditing it to find something that you don't know, you know, is the vulnerability, like a lot of people talk about vulnerability management is, you know, the, the vulnerability management vendors are in charge of your program. Actually, the program is there to audit that. You know, if you're, if you're supposed to patch everything by Friday, well, on Friday or on Saturday, if you scan with Tenable and you find a missing patch, guess what? Your processes are wrong and, and that's there. Expanse, Shodan, uh, security trails, mm -hmm. um, um, some of the other uh, good folks in in in, in this space, um, they are a little bit different, right? They're mapping the entire internet, and they're helping you find things that you didn't even know you had. Uh, if you look at somebody like a, a, a movie theater, where you've got a DNS name and a URL for every actor and and and, and movie and brand, that's hard to that's hard to find. You know, and and if people are doing uh, phishing research or they're trying to do things, you can't just scan the internet with with Nmap, right, or Nessus, or or even even the the, the bigger cloud, you know, uh, ways to distribute that kind of stuff. It's just not really really scalable. So they're two different things, and you're right, they do go together, but they are very very different use cases. Mm. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Adrian. Yeah, so I, uh, you know, just shifting gears a little bit back to the the investment side of things. Uh, curious as to your opinion on on hands on versus hands off approaches for investors. You know, I've noticed uh, particularly with some VCs, um, they're a little bit more hands off, and, and then some VCs are hands on to the point to where you know they're almost involved in assembling the dream team. Uh, you know, and and. Uh, helping to find a an ideal market you know obviously more seed stage vendors and, and uh, are kind of instrumental in in kind of putting that company on its path and pointing them in the right direction yeah so there's there's different types of uh, venture capital uh, you know organizations out there you've got some really really well funded well organized ones so insight for example so we raise money at tenable from insight uh, one of our portfolio companies inky uh, raise money from, uh, from from Insight, and when we raise money from 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 Insight at Tenable, literally Insight has this amazing internal team of people who track markets, track companies. You know, they really understand these markets really really well. But then they also reach out and they talk to people. And I can remember when Insight invested in Tenable. This was you know probably ten years ago. I um, I was getting introduced introduced to like CTOs of motor vehicle companies, and trying to talk about vulnerability management. And it was, it was kind of like this. So I was getting these great introductions, but, but, you know, back, you know, 10, 12 years ago, getting a high level introduction like that. Now, shame on me for not, not, not taking advantage, but there wasn't as much raw kind of introduction. Whereas Inky, you know, phishing, I don't care who you are, what level you are, everybody's gotten phishing email. Mm. So when Inky gets an introduction like that, they can, they can do something, something really well. So, you know, a different one would be if you look at something like uh, like ForgePoint. Uh, ForgePoint, they're investors in um, uh, uh, IronNet, for example, and uh, Huntress. They're they're with us. I think you, you guys have talked to Huntress possibly in the past. So they've got like a CISO network, and and the CISO network is is interesting because on one hand you would think you would come in as a vendor and you'd say, oh, I get to get to meet 
all these chief information security officers that are all going to buy my product, right? Well, the reality is no. You know, most of these people who are, who are volunteering to kind of work with a venture capital firm, you know, they're trying to learn and help. And it's kind of a two-way, two-way street. So those are kind of uh kind of interesting. I think the biggest thing though that that a venture capital person brings to these these smaller companies is perspective. What are the other portfolio companies? Are they being approached by SPACs? Are they being approached by private equity firms? Are, is somebody trying to preempt a round? Like you're not fundraising right now. And literally somebody calls and says, look, we know who you are. We know, kind of know your revenue. We talked to some customers. We want to 3X your last evaluation, right? So every dollar amount you raised at, they're willing to come in at a, at a higher thing. So if you have visibility into that kind of stuff, you can share that with the people you've invested in. And it's it's a tough road to walk because sometimes that's NDA level stuff. Sometimes you don't want to, you know, if you hear about a great idea from somebody who pitches you, you can't just like take that and bring it to a, a, a another company, but it, usually there are no original ideas. It's all about implementation. It, it's, it's a great segue, it, you know, as we talk about various solutions and funding and what technologies companies are adopting, uh, companies also need people to implement these solutions. And I think it's a great uh, chance to talk about data care, something that when I first heard the analogy between cybersecurity and healthcare and how healthcare has defined roles and usually people don't go oh i want to go get a degree in healthcare and go work in, in in healthcare at that generic level they're like i want to be a nurse i want to be a doctor i want to be a technician you know whatever there's various roles with cybersecurity, i feel like we're still stuck ron in oh, i want to do cybersecurity. so that means like i need to be a ninja i need to know how to program i need to know how to pen test and that's that's not true yeah so the data care is is this concept that we're trying to bring cybersecurity to the general public, which, which really solves two big problems that cybersecurity hasn't solved. One is how do we attract more people to this, this industry? We've just done a horrible job educating people in school, guidance mm -hmm. counselors. You know, what does it mean to go into cybersecurity? Or should you be good at STEM? Should you be good at art? Should you be good at music? Some of the best hackers I know are accountants and musicians, right? So it's it's we've done a horrible job trying to do that. But the, the, the other thing that cyber has done a horrible job at is just educating the general public. The technology, maybe the, you know, maybe the technologies move too fast, maybe the complexity is beyond people, but we do not have things like a Dr. Fauci of cybersecurity. We don't have the equivalent of like wearing masks, you know, for mm -hmm. cybersecurity. Some people say that's patching. Some people say it's just, you know, you gotta have your hygiene, right? But nobody can really define, you know, what, what these things are. So data care is a way to talk about all that without making it seem like it's somebody else's problem or that you have to become a cyber brain surgeon in order to be in be in cyber and there's just so many like like imagine the one person it shop at like the doctor's office or the the automotive dealership imagine him or her like going to defcon and giving a talk on what they do the, the cyber industry would like look i i think we're getting better but in, in like years past that would be like, oh no, you would not get on stage. You would not be able to do that, right? So now we're just starting to like uh, getting things like new speakers being coached by old speakers and and uh, that that type of of uh, mentorship. Uh, but for the most part, the cyber industry hasn't been doing that. And I think it's going to take another five, ten years before we really, really start looking something professional like the doctor system or architects or or, or lawyers. You think we need to do a better job with apprenticeship? I hear that that term kind of thrown around, but I think it's different from most people hear that and think of electricians, plumbers, but it has to take a different shape and form in cybersecurity. Yeah. So the the thing with with uh, electricians and plumbers and 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 um, you know doctors and lawyers mm -hmm. is you, you've got pretty much a hundred years of trade craft where you know water still flows downhill. You know mm -hmm. rule of law is pretty much you know do good to others, don't don't take my stuff. You know, electrical, we've been on 120 volts, you know, for, for, for a while. And there's, there's small updates and stuff. And even, even like pilots, right? You know, we're not testing out new wings, you know, when, when you're taking a flight on Southwest down to, down to Florida, right? Whereas with cyber, holy cow, right? We went from a computer to a laptop to an, from a network to wireless to the cloud to, I think we skipped over data centers there, you know, but mobile, yeah. you know, so, so on one hand, Cyber's barely keeping up with the technology. On the other hand, cyber made the mistake of not building sort of our people to take over for us, you know, and try to think about the technology of the future and the roles of the future. So, you know, I mean, if anybody's out there listening and they're they're running, they're like a CISO and you got a SOC and a compliance team and an IT team and whatnot, if you're not continually recruiting, 
if you're not continually training those people and giving them almost from a micromanagement point of view, here's the career path you need to take. One, you're not going to be able to have your, your staff. And two, you certainly aren't going to solve the, the minority problem, you know, and, and, and trying to get more African-Americans, more women, more people from all backgrounds, you know, into this, into this career field. And so I just I wish, really wish we ever had more focus on that. And that's why we came up with data care. Outstanding. And I, I, th I think that's a great lead into, um, I, I really enjoyed your grant awards, uh, uh, show that, that you did with, uh, Cindy, uh, maybe a week and a half ago. And, uh, you know, I thought it'd be a good opportunity for you, for you to mention some of what you're doing there, because I personally, I'm, I been, uh, um, intentionally trying to take on more mentees and, and do more mentoring and, and do it in a more structured manner than I've done in the past. So I, I found a lot of those, those grant awards, uh, really interesting. And I, I appreciate you bringing that up. So when, when we look at the problem of cyber, you know, how do we get the right technology, the right policies and the right people, you know, to that it's, it's, it's great to be able to invest and God bless, you know, my wife and I, or whatever, that's a little self-serving, but you know, we're happy to give, we're happy to, to, to do that. We could have done that really silently. And, and not had a website and not talked about our companies, not trying to be proactive. It's the same thing on the uh, nonprofit side. We could have easily just given and, and not made a big deal out of it, not tried to get a little bit of extra thing because we are trying to be purposeful about drawing more people into this curriculum, talk about the technology, talk about the people, talk about that. And even with the specific you know, opportunity to bring more women, bring more African-Americans, bring more people from all types you know, into this career field, for our first grant, we really wanted to focus on a, on a problem that I think a lot of people wanted to do in cybersecurity, but didn't really know, you know how do you, you know, how do you go and 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 recruit? Like I've I've literally talked with cybersecurity people who just aren't used to dealing with like race issues and 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 uh, you know sex issues, minority issues, and and literally like I've gotten questions like, okay, can we say black? Can we say African American? I'm like, it's okay. Like you're here. So don't, I mean, anything you do in the space, you're going to get some criticism, just like any type of business. Guess what? You're here to help, right? If, you, if you're mentoring, if you're donating money, if you're, if you're showing up to a predominantly, you know, uh, black, low economic school, you know, whatever you're doing there, you're giving people an opportunity. And I mean, some of this came out of, I, I used to joke, and it's really not a joke, but I wanted to create 10 tenables in Maryland because I really felt that starting a business and growing a business was one of the best ways to kind of engage people outside of cybersecurity. As awesome as Tenable is, you know, the thousands of people that who work there, they're not all cybersecurity ninja programmers, right? Mm -hmm. There's lawyers, there's marketing people, you know, there's accountants, there's 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 uh, assistants, there's facilities people, and cyber, you know, really needs a lot of that. And I think it's uh it's it's an interesting question if people say I want to go into the cyber business, what does that really mean? Like do you have to be a third level 3 SOC analyst who can reverse malware in their sleep. Could we use a few more of those people? Absolutely. Do we need like everybody to do that? No. Like we need people to communicate like why this is a problem in the first place. And we're, we're glad you weren't silent about it because we need good examples. You know, we, yeah. we need somebody to, to lead by example there and, and show the rest of the industry, you know, here, here's a way to do that. You know, here's a way to introduce more people and to, you know, uh, kind of sponsor people that are that are already interested in getting into it. So we had we had three winners. We had uh, Girl Security, uh, we had N Power, and we had a Black Cybersecurity Association. And and I say that they were the winners. We got really really good applications to the grant, and and everybody's doing something. Like no, we never got a grant and said, "Wow, that's that's those guys don't know what they're doing." Everybody's doing something. So it was really hard to pick our finalists and to pick some winners. But the ones who stood out was very unique. I mean, girl security was very focused on young black women. Not only did they teach cyber, but they taught a uh, national security strategy. You know, NPower had an existing program where they were teaching basically IT fundamentals in seven different states, cities, you know, that, that type of thing. And they had cyber in two of them and they wanted to expand cyber to all seven of those, those places, which was awesome. And then finally the black cybersecurity association was, was just probably the most comprehensive um, one that we've looked at because they did everything from capture the flag events for, you know, predominantly black, you know, young, young uh, kids, K through 12, all the way to like building like a, a, a mentorship network for, for professionals, which was just, and they had a lot of partnerships and it was just really, really well done. Anybody who wants to check them out, 
uh, go to gula.tech and you can see our winners. And we're going to have a lot of them on our, on our uh, Gula Tech Cyber Fiction show. I've, in, I've uh, encouraged them to get more uh, involved, perhaps with your guys' organization and, you know, talk about what they're doing. Absolutely. And Ron, tell us what Gula Tech Cyber Fiction, is that a, a YouTube show, a podcast? What's the focus? So we, uh, what we do there is it's, uh, it's our show. We put up a studio in the house. We've got a lot of folks in the, the DC, Virginia, Maryland area come by. And what we try to do is just do like a one hour, typically me, sometimes it's me and Cindy, uh, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. And the idea there is to not only talk about stuff like this with folks from cyber, but to really make an effort to reach outside of uh, the cybersecurity industry. So we had some of these people we've had on are a little bit more in the famous column than, than not. So we had Sid Meier, who was the uh, author of uh, Civilization, wrote a lot of video games. We talked about why aren't there you know, any great cybersecurity video games. We had uh, Charlie Bolden. Uh, he was the first, uh, one of the first black astronauts, and he ran NASA for a bunch of years for President Obama. We also had uh, the cast of MacGyver. So we actually had uh, the full cast of MacGyver. If you've watched MacGyver on CBS, they've, the hack, hacking is a, a really interesting uh, thing. So we're trying to reach out. So we got a couple NFL football players coming on and uh, we're going after some musicians and stuff, but we're supplementing that with our portfolio founders and you know, mm -hmm. folks from the industry, uh, with folks from our Google Tech uh, Foundation uh, advisory board. And uh, so we're having a lot of fun getting that, uh, getting people on air, talking about cybersecurity in a lot of different ways. Fantastic. Check it all out at agula.tech. Ron, always nice to speak with you. Thanks for coming on the show today. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy your future in the data care industry and keep up the, the great work. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back with the Enterprise Security News. Stay tuned. <laughs> 